Okay, uh, so thanks everybody for, for making it out and thanks Lionel for, for giving the talk. Uh, today, as I said, we've got Lionel Levine from Cornell University uh, and he will be talking about abelian sand piles and abelian networks. Go ahead and take us away. Okay, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I wanted to say, since it's a small crowd, you should please uh, stop me with any questions. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is it helps me um, give a better talk if you turn your video on so I can see people's reactions and uh, whether uh, I'm interesting or boring for you. Okay, thank you to those of you who turned it on. Um, so I want to tell you today about a uh, mathematical love of mine, abelian sand files. Um, but I'm also, in addition to telling you what I love about them, I'm going to tell you what I don't like so much about them. Um, which is they're very fussy, they're very sensitive to the underlying graph and to the initial condition. And um, we're going to uh, make that statement precise in various ways. And then we'll search through a broader space of models that I call abelian networks for a more universal model, which doesn't uh, depend so much on the details of how it's set up. So, before I tell you mathematically what a sand pile is, let me tell you the physical, um, the physical metaphor. So you can imagine a big pile of sand and you're sprinkling additional sand grains on top of the pile. And when you sprinkle each sand grain, you can't control exactly where it falls on the pile. So it falls in a random place. And when it falls on the pile, it may or may not dislodge sand grains nearby. And so some sand grains might start to trickle down the pile uh, as a result of the grain of sand you dropped. And the model is going to be a kind of toy combinatorial model of um, these kind of avalanches of sand. And there'll be a particular parameter that we're interested in, namely the slope of the pile. So again, before the mathematical details, I'll tell you where this model came from. It came from a physics paper, 1987, by Bach, Tang, and Wiesenfeld. And the, the question they were interested in answering is why do you see so many heavy-tailed probability distributions in nature? Um, or another way of asking this is why do you see long-range correlations in nature? So many physical systems if I tell you what the system looks like in a particular place, then that has a non-trivial correlation with what it looks like somewhere else far away. Um, so you know, how do long range correlations arise since the laws of physics are ultimately local, there's no action at a distance. And the mechanism that they came up with uh, for why these things arise, they gave this buzzword, which people still use today, they called it self-organized criticality. And so let me just illustrate it uh, with the example of a pile of sand. So if you um, actually form a pile of sand and do the physical experiment of sprinkling sand grains on the top, what you'll find is that there is a critical slope of the pile, which I call zeta c, such that if your pile is resting exactly at that slope, then when you drop uh, an additional sand grain on top of the pile and measure what's the probability that it will dislodge 10 sand grains as a result or 100 sand grains as a result. Right? This probability will decay like a power of the threshold. So the probability that you dislodge at least T grains of sand will decay like a power of T. And that power law only happens experimentally, it only happens at this critical slope. If you started with a pile that was flatter than the critical slope like this one here, then when you drop sand on top of it, you will hardly ever see big avalanches. So the, the chance of seeing, uh, the chance of dislodging more than T grains of sand will decay exponentially in T. And as a result of that exponential decay, as you drop more and more sand on this flat pile, it doesn't trickle very far down the pile. And so the slope of the pile tends to increase. Um, conversely, if you started above the critical slope, then you formed a very, very unstable sand pile. Uh, 
and so unstable that if you drop just a small amount of sand on the top of it, you'll create huge avalanches that will tend to flatten out the pile. Uh, so you see that dropping sand on a pile has this natural mechanism. Whatever slope you started with, even if it was less than zeta c, it will increase to zeta c. If it was greater than zeta c, it will decrease to zeta c. And so, so that was Bakhtang and Wiesenfeld's idea that you know, some physical systems, even if they don't start at, uh, critical, in a critical state, they have a dynamics that tends to drive them toward that state. Okay, so with that as motivation, let's define a mathematical model of a sand pile. This will take place on a finite connected graph G, and I'll write the tilde for the adjacency relation of this graph. And we'll define a, a sand pile on this graph as an integer valued function on the vertices. Notice I allow this function to take either positive or negative integer values. Most of the time it will be positive, but at a certain point it will be useful to take it negative. So the way you should interpret this function is um, if you have a vertex i where s of i is positive, you should think of there being uh, that many sand grains at vertex i. So the, the grains of sand live at the vertices of our graph. And since it's shorter to say, I will sometimes call the sand grains chips or particles. Now, how should you interpret a negative value of S? You should, rather than a number of sand grains, you should interpret it as a hole that could be filled up with sand. So that's the interpretation of negative values. And in our toy universe of sand piles on graphs, there is one law of physics, and it's, it's this one down here. It says that vertex I is allowed to topple if the number of sand grains at vertex i is greater than or equal to the degree of i, the number of, um, of neighbors of i in the graph. And what does it mean to topple? You topple by sending one chip to each neighbor. Now it's useful to rephrase this toppling rule in terms of the graph Laplacian. Now rather than, I can of course think of the graph Laplacian as a matrix, but I'd like to think of it uh, as an integer matrix. And so it acts on integer valued functions on the vertices. So, so ZV is the free abelian group generated vertices. Um, I'll write delta I for its standard basis vectors. So delta I is one at coordinate I and zero elsewhere. And then um, capital delta, the graph Laplacian, uh, what does it do? It acts on a function F and it produces another function. And that function's value at vertex i is defined as the sum over neighbors of i of the difference fj minus f of i, which you can also write this way. Um, now, what's the relevance of the graph Laplacian to sand piles? Um, to see the relevance, just apply the graph Laplacian to one of these standard basis vectors, delta i. And what you will get is the vector that is equal to one at neighbors j of i, it's equal to negative the degree of i at vertex i, and it's equal to zero elsewhere. So toppling vertex i transforms the sand pile s to the new sand pile s plus delta delta i. Now we want to capture the idea of avalanches in this model, and those are sequences of topplings, right? So the idea is when I topple the vertex x1, that might cause some other vertices to be able to topple, and then I want to topple those other vertices. I could get a cascade of topplings. But then you have the question, well, in what order should I perform these topplings? So I'll define a sequence of vertices x1 through xm to be legal for a sand pile S0. If at each point, so if it's, I have enough chips at X1 to topple X1, and then after toppling X1, I have enough chips at X2 to topple X2 and so on, all the way down the line. So at each index I, um, the number of chips at XI after toppling the previous I minus one vertices is at least a degree of XI. Okay. 
Okay, so that's one particular legal ordering in which I could perform topplings. The kind of dual notion to legal is stabilizing. So I'll call a sequence stabilizing if uh, after doing the topplings x1 through xm, I can no longer topple anything else. So if the final send file sm is pointwise less than or equal to degree minus one, then I say the toppling sequence is stabilizing. And now we get to the reason that this is called the abelian sand pile model. So there's a certain sense in which order of topplings doesn't matter. Um, so to make that precise, here's a, a basic lemma that makes everything work in, in this model. Let S be a sand pile on our graph and suppose we we'll make a very weak assumption just that there exists a stabilizing sequence, say y1 up through ym for this sand file. We're not even assuming that the sequence is legal, just that it's stabilizing. Okay, then we get a bunch of consequences. First of all, any legal sequence has to be a subsequence of a permutation of the stabilizing sequence y. So the existence of a stabilizing sequence automatically will give you an upper bound on the length of any legal sequence. Secondly, um, just the existence of a stabilizing sequence will actually give existence of a legal and stabilizing sequence simply by taking a legal sequence of maximal length. So the, the empty sequence is trivially legal. Uh, so there's at least one legal sequence. And if you take a legal sequence of maximal length, then um, it must be stabilizing, otherwise you could extend it to a longer one. And, and finally, this, this last point is, is sometimes called the abelian property. Any two legal and stabilizing sequences, well, one has to be a subsequence of a permutation of the other and vice versa. So they must just be permutations of one another. So this lemma took a while to state, but the proof is actually very easy. So the proof is just suppose X were a legal sequence and Y were a stabilizing sequence, then in order for Y to be stabilizing, we have to at some point get around to toppling X1, the first term of the legal sequence. So YI equals X1 for some I. So now you could cross off X1 from the legal sequence, cross off YI from the stabilizing sequence and induct on the length. Sometimes this argument goes by the name diamond lemma. Um, so consequences of this, every sand pile has what we call an odometer function, which measures the total number of topplings that take place. So uh, for a sand pile S, the odometer function U at vertex X is the number of occurrences of X in any legal and stabilizing toppling sequence. This number doesn't depend on the legal stabilizing toppling sequence because they're all permutations of one another. And uh, the second basic object associated to S is the stabilization, which I'll call S hat. And to find the stabilization, you just take any legal and stabilizing toppling sequence, call it X1 through XL, and you take S and you topple those sequences in that, in that order. Um, now, of course, the Laplacian is linear, so you can write this as S plus delta of the sum of these basis vectors, and the sum of these basis vectors is nothing but the odometer function. So this down here in the red box is the basic equation uh, relating the sand pile, its odometer function, and its stabilization. So I want to pause at this point just to show you a picture that the stabilization even if S is a very simple object, the stabilization S hat could be a very complex object. So this picture that I'm about to show comes from uh, my collaborator, Wes Pegden's website. Let's see. Let's try this. Okay. okay, so hopefully you can see an image of a sand pile. It's got some red, some yellow, and some blue. Okay, good. So 
Um, so what this picture is, is you started with uh, two to the power 30 chips uh, in the middle at the origin, and your underlying graph is Z2, the square grid. So with nearest neighbor adjacencies. So every vertex has four neighbors. And um, that means it takes four chips to topple. And when you do a toppling, you send one chip north, one chip east, one chip west, one chip south to the four nearest neighbors. Okay. And we've started with this large number two to the 30 chips at the origin, which means we can do a whole lot of topplings at the origin. And then the neighbors of the origin will get a lot of chips and we can topple them a whole lot of times and so on. And these chips will spread out to fill a large finite region of Z2. Um, everything in blue here was not reached by the chips and everything in a color other than blue was reached. There, there are uh, four colors in this picture. I'm zooming in now on you know, a piece of the picture somewhere in the middle. Maybe I'll zoom in a little more. So now you can see individual pixels of this picture. And each pixel represents a vertex of Z2. And the four colors indicate how many chips were at that vertex in the stabilization. So this dark reddish color represents three chips. Um, and yellow represents two, light blue represents one, and dark blue represents zero chips. And what I find fascinating about this picture, if you move around in it, you could see various periodic patterns of sand emerging. So here we have a little piece of the picture where you get this periodic pattern with kind of uh, blue crosses with yellow in the center and, and uh, these red and diagonal lines. But if we zoomed in to a different portion of the picture, well, here's a very simple pattern. It's just all red. So here's a region of the sand pile that's completely filled up with the maximum number of three chips per vertex. Um, and well, here's another pattern of alternating threes and zeros and so on. So this picture is quite, uh, is quite intricate. And uh, what I find really interesting about it is you know, all these different periodic patterns that occur in the picture, um, while they occur, they're predict there's a pattern to the patterns, right? The patterns occur in predictable places and there are different patterns in different places, despite the fact that there's only one law of physics in the sand pile universe. You know, topplings are the same in this region um, as they are in, you know, this region but the pattern of sand you see is, is completely different. So with a lot of work, we were able to classify these patterns for the square grid. There are countably many of them and they're classified by the, the circles in an Apollonian circle packing of the plane. Um, so that was really cool. However, everything changes when you change the lattice. So now I've changed to the triangular lattice and let me zoom back out. So here's a sand pile of two to the 29 chips on the triangular lattice. And you could see broadly, it looks similar. There are many different patterns and they occur um, in different places, but the, you know, the specifics are different. So the patterns are different. The places where they occur are different. So even the limiting shape uh, is different. And every time you change the lattice, you get, uh, sort of a variation on the theme. So, so what's interesting about this model is although it has a scaling limit, so these pictures have a, a weak star limit as you, know, as you take the lattice finer and finer and increase the number of chips you started at the origin, um, they have a limit that is no longer a function on the lattice, but a function on R2. However, that function remembers the fact that it used to live on a lattice. And it, be, you know, it behaves differently depending on what the lattice was, even though the lattice spacing has shrunk to zero. So it's a, it's a lattice dependent limit. And uh, that's the first indication that this model, while it's, you know, does fascinating things, uh, it's not very universal, right? It depends uh, a lot on the underlying graph. 
So what can we hope to say about this stabilization S hat? We've seen that it could be a very complicated object. Um, but let's write down the simplest thing we know about it, which is it's pointwise smaller than degree minus one, simply because it's, it's stable. Um, so given a sand pile S, we'd like to say as much as we can about its stabilization S hat. And because of this equation, it's equivalent if you can describe the odometer function u, then you can describe the stabilization S hat and vice versa. So here's something, here's a characterization of u, which we call the least action principle. Um, suppose S is a sand pile for which there exists a, a non-negative integer valued function w that satisfies this inequality that S plus delta W is pointwise smaller than degree minus one. From that, you can conclude that S stabilizes and the odometer of U, the number of top links that occur is the pointwise smallest such function W. So among all functions W that satisfy these constraints, you take the pointwise infimum. So one way to interpret this is uh, depending whether you like negative or positive words, that sand piles are lazy if you like the negative words or they're efficient if you like the positive words. So basically the sand pile S, uh, it wants to stabilize and it will do so in the smallest possible number of toplings and not just the smallest possible total number of toplings, but actually the pointwise smallest number of toplings. Each site topples the fewest number of times that it possibly can to convert S to a stable sand pile. Now, one natural reaction when you see a problem like this, it's an, it's an integer programming problem, right? So we have this linear constraint on this unknown uh, W and um, we have another linear constraint that just W is non-negative. But the tricky thing about this problem is that W has to take values in the natural numbers. Um, so a natural reflex is to relax this problem, replace the natural numbers by the non-negative real numbers. If you do that, you get something called the divisible sand pile. And if you want to think in terms of a particle system, instead of having discrete chips performing topplings, you have a continuous amount of mass at each vertex. And the, the, the law of physics in this divisible sand pile is each, each vertex has a capacity, say capacity one. And if it gets more mass than one, it distributes the extra mass equally among its neighbors. So it's allowed to um, distribute you know, fractional amounts of mass. That's what distinguishes it from the abelian sand pile. Turns out this totally changes the behavior. So, you might um, be surprised by that because like if you, if you did an experiment with a large number, let's say on the square lattice, like we just saw, if you start with a large number of chips at the origin, then there's gonna be a lot of topplings. Um, you can show that the odometer is order n squared typically, you know, near that, you know, when you're not too close to the edge of the picture, it's order n squared. So, you know, if n was a million, then a typical site is gonna to topple a million squared, like a trillion times. And so what does it matter if it's a trillion or a trillion point five? You know, that seems like it would be a very, um, very small difference. But uh, it turns out when you require everything to be integer valued, then um, that somehow interacts with the, uh, with the linear constraints in, it, uh, in an important way. And you actually get a different limit shape. So we saw um, with the abelian sand pile, the limit shape was lattice dependent and it had all this internal structure, all these different patterns at different points. In divisible sand pile, the limit shape is actually a disc in two dimensions or a Euclidean ball in, in higher dimensions. And you lose all the internal structure. Basically you just, you fill up completely a very nearly disc shaped region of the lattice. And uh, the only sites that retain a fractional amount of mass are right on the boundary of that close to disc shaped region. Um, so, so that's a big difference between these models. Um, 
another experiment you can do in the sand pile universe is instead of starting uh, with this deterministic finite configuration of n chips at the origin, you could start with an infinite configuration that's stationary and ergodic. So the simplest example of that would be, let's take every site in Z2 to have a random number of chips. With some probability P, it has four chips. With some probability one minus P, it has zero chips. Right? And then you see, can you stabilize this random sand pile or not? Well, it turns out there's a critical mean, that, you know, there's a critical value of P such that if you're above that critical value, then you cannot stabilize. And if you're below it, then you can stabilize. Um, but what happens is it, that mean depends on the distribution. So instead of fours and zeros, if I took, you know, fours and ones and zeros, or, you know, or Poisson distribution or a geometric distribution, each of those will have a different uh, critical mean. And you can actually get any critical mean between two and three, depending on the distribution. That's another example of kind of fussiness of this sand pile model. It, it sees the whole distribution of uh, random chips, not just the mean. In contrast, the divisible sand pile only cares about the mean. So if the mean is uh, strictly less than one, then you almost surely will stabilize. And if the mean is greater than or equal to one, then you almost surely uh, do not stabilize. Here's another experiment you can do. You could fold up Z2 to a torus, a, a discrete torus, Z mod LZ squared. So you're taking a piece of, of Z2 and you give it periodic boundary conditions. And then you can run a Markov chain where at each time step you drop a sand grain at a random vertex and then stabilize. Now, there are two versions of this chain. I call them the wire chain and the free chain. The free chain is um, just what I said, you drop sand at a random vertex and then stabilize. Problem with the free chain is there's no way for sand to escape the system. You've got this finite system and at each time step, you're adding one grain of sand. Topplings conserve the total amount of sand. So at some point, you will reach what I call a threshold state, which fails to stabilize because there's too much sand in this finite system. And then what you might hope is that this threshold state has some universal properties as L goes to infinity. Um, in particular, you might hope that it is uniformly distributed on the set of recurrent states of uh, the wire chain. So what's the wire chain? The wire chain is, I do the same Markov chain, but I fix a vertex, um, here I called it Z, and declare it the sink. So the sink is a vertex that just absorbs sand and is not ever allowed to topple. You think of the metaphor as you have a pile of sand on top of a table, and as you're dropping more sand, it gets bigger and eventually sand falls off the table, disappears from the system. Advantage of the wire chain is uh, you could show it always stabilizes. So you, can, you don't have to stop when you reach this threshold state because you can run it as long as you like and it will always stabilize. The sink is absorbing chips. Um, and this wire chain has some very nice properties. In particular, its stationary distribution is uniform on uh, the set of recurrent states. And these recurrent states have some nice combinatorial properties. Um, they are in bijection with spanning trees of the underlying graph. So in this case, spanning trees of the torus. Um, so you might hope that this threshold state will reflect some um, properties of this nice uniform distribution on the recurrent state. However, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't has to do with the mixing time of the wire chain. Wire chain actually has a rather large mixing time. So its stationary distribution is this nice uniform thing. Um, but what we showed with Bob Huff and Daniel Jerison is that it takes a long time to reach that stationary distribution. You have to drop on order L squared log L chips in order to get close to the stationary distribution. And notice that's bigger than the number of vertices, which is only L squared. So what's happening is if you start say from the all zero sand pile, 
and you run the free chain, then you're going to reach the threshold state in time order L squared. And that's not enough time for the wire chain to mix. And um, that turns out to be the underlying reason why the threshold state doesn't have um, nice, nice properties. There's one limit where I was able to show that it does have some universal properties. And that's the limit where the initial condition tends to minus infinity. So if you think about this long mixing time, one way to allow the sand pile more time to mix is to start with a very negative initial condition. Um, that way it takes longer to reach this threshold state. And in the limit, as you take the initial condition to minus infinity, you do recover some universality. The way to do it is you should keep, so you should start with this very negative initial condition and then keep track of when you finally reach the threshold state, what was the last um, vertex where you added sand to cause the infinite avalanche. I call that the epicenter of the infinite avalanche, um, I sub tau. And if you then take I sub tau as your sink vertex for the wire chain, uh, then the recurrent representative of the threshold state becomes exactly the uniform uh, recurrent state. So there's this one case when you recover the universality, but you need to take this um, minus infinity limit. So it's somehow saying uh, a typical sand pile retains some memory, the threshold state retains some memory of its initial state, and so it's not universal. But you can remove that memory by taking the initial state to minus infinity. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I want to say about sand piles. And uh, the remainder of my time, I want to talk about the general class of abelian networks. So what we're going to do after I define abelian networks, we'll search through this class um, to try to find a model with more universal properties than the sand pile model. So abelian networks, the idea goes back to the physicist Deepak Dar in 1999. And the type of network I'm going to describe, I call a unary network with two stacks. So the way it works is that basically we're going to change our viewpoint. Instead of the sand grains being the active participants in our model, the sand grains will be passive and the vertices of the graph become the active participants. And the way you should think of this is each vertex is like a little computer. It's an automaton and uh, it can change its internal state. And so when it, when it reads a letter, it can change its internal state and it can send letters to um, its neighbors, depending on what its internal state was and what letter it read. So the way I want to encode the states of these automata are in what I call a movement stack and activity stack. So these are infinite stacks of instructions associated to each vertex. Um, the movement stack is an infinite sequence of vertices, rho k of v indexed by natural numbers k, and the activity stack is an infinite sequence of natural numbers. And so again, there's a single rule. It might be harder to process than the toppling rule of the sand pile. Um, but what it says is that if vertex V receives a total of L letters, then um, V will send out a total of alpha V letters. And where does it send them? The kth letter that it sends out is sent to the vertex rho K of V. So alpha tells you how many letters to send and rho tells you where to send them. And we're only going to require one axiom of this alpha and rho, which is monotonicity of, of alpha. So alpha L is pointwise smaller than alpha L plus one. This axiom basically says that you cannot take back letters once you've sent them. So, um, so this axiom is what will guarantee an abelian property. In general, if I have a network of automata that are communicating with each other, uh, it can be wildly non-abelian, right? So order in general will matter a lot. Uh, but it turns out if your network of, of automata has this form that uh, its behavior is governed by this movement stack and activity stack, as long as you have monotonicity 
of the activity stack, uh, then you have an abelian property where the order in which the automata act doesn't affect the uh, odometer function, it doesn't affect the final state. So it turns out a lot of familiar um, examples can be recast uh, in this framework of a unary network with two stacks. So let's consider a simple random walk. So I'm going to have a sync. So in this incarnation of random walk, instead of having an active walker who makes a decision at every time step which neighbor to jump to, I have a passive walker. The walker is a letter that's getting passed between automata in my network. And so I want to keep the system in a state where there's always exactly one letter. And the way I do that is just by declaring alpha to be the identity function, alpha of L equals L. So that's saying if I received a total of L letters, then I also emit a total of L letters. And the rows, the movement stacks, I just take them to be um, independent uniform neighbors of vertex B. So that tells me the kth time I received a letter, I should send a letter to a uniformly chosen neighbor independent of the path. You could kill your random walk at some vertex Z if you want, just by declaring alpha of that vertex to be zero instead of uh, L. So that's saying vertex Z becomes a sink. It never emits any letters. So when your letter reaches vertex Z, it just gets absorbed there. Um, you could do branching random walk in this framework by taking alpha as suitably random. Um, you can do a uh, process called internal DLA, where uh, each, uh, each vertex absorbs the first particle it receives, and then thereafter it uh, sends it to a random neighbor. So you do that by taking alpha L equals L minus one instead of L. Uh, you can do the sand pile. The way you do the sand pile in this framework is you take, instead of taking the movement stacks random, you take them periodic. So the movement stack at vertex V will be periodic with period degree of V, and one period will be a permutation of the neighbors of V. And then you take the activity stack to be uh, the closest multiple of the degree rounded down. So the effect of these two choices is that each, each automaton, when it receives letters, it saves them up until it has a multiple, an integer multiple of the degree, and then it sends them all out one to each neighbor. You can combine the uh, periodic movement stacks with the alpha L equals L, and then you get something called rotor walk, which is a kind of a de-randomization of random walk. So instead of going to a random neighbor at each time step, you cycle through the neighbors in a, a predefined periodic order. There's walks that are intermediate between rotor walk and random walk. I call them random walks with local memory. So you keep alpha L equals L. So there's always exactly one um, letter in the system, but you could take the uh, movement stacks to be Markovian. So that's saying that um, when you arrive, when, you're, when your walker arrives at a given vertex, uh, it decides what neighbor to jump to. It draws from a distribution, which um, depends on the past history of what the walker did at that vertex. Right? So that, that history itself is a Markov chain. Um, you can do sand piles with stochastic topplings instead of deterministic topplings. So um, basically, instead of sending one chip to each neighbor, you can send each chip to uh, an independent um, random neighbor. You can do something called the rice pile, um, which kind of models um, sand grains that have a very different aspect ratio. They're long like rice instead of roughly spherical like sand. And what I currently consider the most promising um, model for something that has universal properties is it's called activated random walk. 
And what you do for activated random walk, so if I describe it in terms of these stacks, I take row to be um, independent uniform neighbors, just like for random walk. And instead of taking alpha L equals L, I'll take it um, L with some probability and L minus one with some probability. So it's giving each vertex a little bit of stickiness. So if you have an L for which alpha L equals L minus one, then you have a particle that gets stuck at vertex V. And it will get stuck there until another particle jumps on top of it, in which case it can keep going. So an equivalent description of activated random walk is each particle in your system, it performs random walk, but at each time step, it has some probability of falling asleep. And particles that fall asleep, they remain uh, asleep until another particle jumps on top of them, in which case they wake up and keep walking. Okay, this is, right. Okay, this is the last slide of this portion of the talk and maybe it's actually a good place to stop, but I'll say that uh, the, right now, my collaborators and I have a lot of conjectures about activated random walk and, uh, well, we have a few theorems, but they're very weak. So we conjecture that uh, it's much more universal than the sand pile, for example, its limit shape should be a disk instead of a lattice dependent shape. Um, but we're far from proving that. Um, we also conjecture that if you look at its stationary distribution on finite pieces of, for example, the square lattice, then those distributions will have a limit as the size of the finite piece goes to infinity. We're also far from proving that. Um, recently with Fang Lian, we uh, found an upper bound on the mixing time. So we saw that mixing for the abelian sand pile was kind of one of the key things that made it not universal. So upper bounding the mixing time is one step in the right direction. But still, most of the interesting properties of this model are open. And uh, if you're interested in it, there's a great survey by Leonardo Rolla um, last year, from last year, you can find on the archive. Um, uh, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Lionel. If we could all thank Lionel in some way, and we'll go ahead and open it up for questions as well. Do we have any questions for Lionel? You don't happen to have any pictures of the activated random walk, do you? So they're surprisingly boring, right? The problem is we don't know how to prove that they're boring. So mm -hmm. what they look like is, so if I, if I start N chips at the origin in Z2, I fill up what looks like a perfect disk and inside the disk, I see noise, right? I see very evenly spread out, um, sleeping particles. Um, in fact, they're more, they're more evenly spread out than you might guess. So um, one conjecture we have is called hyper-uniformity. It says that if you look at the variance of the number of particles in uh, a box of volume V, the variance grows uh, sublinearly in V, which is implies some kind of uh, well, you need some long range correlations for that to happen. The particles, the sleeping particles, they kind of repel each other. So they manage to spread out very, very evenly. Um, and we don't, I mean, intuitively, yeah, it makes sense that they would not want to fall asleep right next to each other. Um, but uh, having this variance be sublinear in the volume is, is a very, to me, surprising finding. I don't know why it's true. Do we have any other questions for Lionel? What is, yeah, what is a, 
What does long range behavior of the activated random walk look like on a finite graph? Well, it should look like, so let's say we take our finite graph just to be an interval, right? So that's a very, that ought to be a very simple graph, but uh, it turns out to be a complicated Markov chain. So I drop my particles, say, at the left endpoint of the interval, and they do activated random walks. So they fall asleep, they wake each other up, and they can fall off the edges of the interval. Say it's a path of length L. So they can fall off the left endpoint or the right endpoint. And eventually you'll reach a stationary distribution of sleeping particles on the interval. And it's hyper uniform in experiments. So the sleeping particles are very regularly spaced. Okay, it's still random. So they're not exactly equally spaced, but they're very close to it. Um, we don't know how to prove that. And that implies some long range correlation because if I told you there's a particle at vertex five, and I know that in the stationary distribution, the average spacing is 50, then I can go and look, you know, far away from vertex five and predict with high success rate whether or not there'll be a particle um, in that far away location. Does it appear that the sort of empirical frequencies of the, when, when it stabilizes are proportional to the uh, random walk uh, uh, limiting distribution? So there's one parameter in the model. It's this, it's this P, which is um, the chance of falling asleep at each time step. Mm -hmm. uh, as you increase P, the stationary distribution becomes denser. Um, so, but we don't know an exact um, form for this stationary distribution. One, one thing that's not too hard to prove is you can exactly sample from the stationary distribution. There's a simple algorithm, which is you start with one particle at every vertex of your graph, uh, and then you stabilize. So you let all your particles walk around, reach the sink. Some of them reach the sink, some the rest of them fall asleep, and then you will exactly be in the stationary distribution. So that doesn't take too long on a finite connected graph. So you can sample in polynomial time from the stationary distribution. But um, somehow the sampling algorithm doesn't give us, or we haven't been able to use it to get much insight into the distribution itself. Um, I guess, yeah, I, I was thinking without sinks on a finite graph. Without a sink. Yeah, yeah that's another thing you can do. So then your Markov chain should not be adding a particle because you don't want to mm. you know, put too many particles in the system so that it fails to stabilize. But your Markov chain can be, you, know, you start with all, a bunch of sleeping particles then you wake one up and stabilize. So you wake one up, it walks around, maybe it wakes up some other ones, eventually they all fall asleep. So that's another interesting Markov chain. And we also don't have a good handle on its stationary distribution. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thanks again, Lionel, and thanks everybody for making it out and have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.